I just have to wait for my microphone button to light up on the interface. Hello and welcome to another episode of Legends of the Drowned Isles, Campaign 2, The Great Confusion. We are gathered here once more to play a homebrew 5th ed D&D campaign in the world of Omatia, a, a homebrew world which uh, has peculiarities about it, not least of which is that a thousand years before the first campaign, a god was removed from the world. That was the legend they had uncovered, and the legend now they seem to be in the midst of. Uh, I am Mark the Encaffeinated One. I'm your host and GM, and along with me, I have, of course, my wonderful players, starting with Pat. I am wonderful Pat. Um, I am playing Silas, uh, cultist entertainer. Hi, uh, my name is Murray, and I am playing Annie, the the human rogue. Hey, and I'm Nax, and I'm playing Medrek, half-orc cleric. All right, and uh, hopefully, uh, I should find some, some there some wood to knock on. Uh, hopefully, some of the uh, technological issues have been mitigated, so hopefully, this comes out a lot clearer for you uh, at home. Uh, let's begin with a recap. In the previous session, the group woke up, rested, and restored in the broad, ancient limbs of Azamunta, the mysterious tree of lonely Tree Island. Namti, the tree's lifelong companion, presented them with gifts, both as rewards for the great stories and for the promise to plant Azumunta's seed one day. Regalesta had not yet awakened, so Silas and Annie placed the few shards of her heartstone that they'd rescued over her heart. They dissolved, and she came awake for the first time since the battle. She was surprised to find all of the presence of her enlightened self gone, and chose to go back to an earlier name she held, Silene. The group waded out into the water beyond the reach of Azumunta, and noticed that it vanished behind them. Soon they spotted a familiar ship, the errant widow slowly making its way across the bay, pulled by long oars as the mast was not yet repaired. Silas called out to them with a booming voice that ricocheted off the stones of Cape Raven, and they were soon rescued by Gaetano and crew. Having returned now to shore, the group found a bit of a quiet moment, some time to see to longer plans and investigate ongoing mysteries. Medric spent time making connections and building up funds before finally working to rebuild the Temple of Ignis, smaller this time, just to start. While carousing, Medric also discovered some information about the diamond and Clockwinder. Annie visited the winter farm and held uh, to help them from to help them permanently bring on a year-long staff and discovered that they had temporarily hired more workers to make it through the harvest including Arneve. She also lurked around Cape Raven to learn a little bit more about the Baron's estate. And Silas spent some time in celebration with the clan hoping to cement his position as harbinger and leader as well as seeking out an artist to help him build the statue of the mother. Then he turned his attention to the making of a magic item with the aid of Dr. Marigold, a pair of twilight goggles, which he presented to Annie as a peace offering. Throughout all of this, there is a considerable buzz in the town as Chamberlain Aknorada declared a return to the tradition of summer festivals. The Baron had decreed that the 17th of Yuri, in just over four weeks then, there would be a celebration around the town, a new monument to be installed, and a private party to be held at the estates. It is now currently the 10th of Yuri. That party is just about a week away. Uh, a couple of things about that. Uh, there have been caravans that have started to come into town uh, bringing what look like entertainers. Uh, there's even one sort of a circus uh, caravan that's come into town bringing a few exotic animals and taking up uh, residence in a uh, part of the town uh, kind of on the east southeastern edge, uh, a little bit away from most of the things. The southeastern edge is also where you find uh, Wish's um, uh, blacksmith as well. Um, with that, there is a bit of a buzz, and there have been uh, a lot of people hired to reconstruct the town. Among those things being being done is the roads are being graded once more removing some of the larger rocks and, and uh, pits that have been created from the ongoing storm and the spout that you fought uh, to get rid of. 
and the occasional sea devil corpse or two. Those are already gone <laughs> very, very quickly, having disappeared one night. And you suspect you know exactly who has attended to that. Probably Dr. Marigold mm -hmm. and his servant, uh, Dolver. Um, but also in town, there is a sense of, of, uh, of a festive atmosphere. Special foods are going to be prepared. And for that, the hunts have gone up to uh, try to uh, fetch some, some uh, more animals than usual. Um, because of, of your kind of connection to the Winthrop Farm, you even hear that the Winthrop Farm is producing some mutton and some cheese that has been aged for a while uh, from the, the milk of their many cows. Uh, as well as a few of the cows will probably get slaughtered along the way as well to help feed the hungry hordes. Ships have been returning back into the dock, uh, having heard that the, the uh, bay is once more uh, clear to enter. Uh, and during this time, the mast of the errant widow was also repaired, and Gaetano, just after Annie's birthday, uh, took off to sail back to the kingdom to make his report in person and also a few other things along the way. But he was... Ill a little cagey about what those things were. Um, so, you've had some time to relax, some time to get some things further forward. Let's begin a little bit with Medric. Tell me about this temple that you've built. Well, there is a temple that me and a dude named... Lawrence? Lawrence and his friends helped me build. I just closed the file, but I can reopen it again. <laughs> I had it in my mind, I swear. Right, so it's a fairly simple small temple, but it gets the job done. There's a small entryway to get in where people can, like, I don't know, wipe off their shoes, I guess, because that's the purpose of an entryway, which leads directly to the congregation area, which has a fire not right in the middle, but, like, close to the middle, near the back of the room a bit. And also in the back of the room, there's exits towards either side. One goes to the washroom, the other one goes to the kitchen. And it has space for two apprentices, which I don't have yet, but hopefully at some point. And there's also sleeping quarters, which would fit two apprentices and like three, a little bit cramped, and a shed on the outside. And there is not a secret door between the shed and the uh, sleeping quarters at all. There's a poster with a flame on it, which hides nothing. So it's, it's a non-obvious door. <laughs> not <No>. necessarily secret. <laughs> um one question. One of the gifts mm -hmm. that Namti gave you was a very small uh, shard of, of uh, sunstone, uh, yep. starstone rather, that was wrapped up in uh, Azamunta's heartwood. Did you do anything with that particularly, or are you, are you keeping that for later? I'm keeping it for until I can contact the, uh, like my superiors, basically, and it's like, hey, can somebody come down here and light the Everflame, or can you give me instructions on how to do it? Okay. I don't want to mess this up because these are pretty hard to come by. Okay. It's warm to the touch, um, especially to you. It's only warm. Anyone else might find it uncomfortable, but it does not yet give off uh, really any light or heat at the moment, uh, being so wrapped up in the heartwood. And the heartwood itself is, is, is uh, you can see, singed around the edges, probably when it initially was hit, uh, but seems to have grown up to contain this. Um, kind of a remarkable artifact. Yeah, so I'm not going to take it out until I'm ready to like light the flame, basically. Okay. At which point, uh, I'm assuming there's going to be kind of a hole in the ceiling, which is covered right now, because what if it rains? But eventually the Everflame is going to stick out of the roof, so everybody can see it. Okay. So later on you'll add a pillar and, and, uh, yeah. and some sort of some sort of arrangement with the roof to try to let the Everflame out, but let most, let most of the rain not come in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the rain uh, can come in. It's just going to, it's just going to evaporate. Okay. Uh, while you were out carousing, uh, you specifically sought out Lysandra mm -hmm. uh, and spent some time with her. Make an insight check, please. Oh, roll 20. That's what I forgot. Interlude music. <laughs> 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 I wish I had a license. I have some uh, some delightful, uh, strange, uh, 80s turkey uh, s sort of electronica from that <laughs> age that would, would fit perfectly for this. Inside. 
Oh, 21. Really good. Okay. It was 16 plus 5. So as you spend some time with Lissandra, um, she still seems to be quite awkward, but she's starting to fit in a little bit more. And people are starting to, in a way, uh, treat her awkwardness as a familiar and uh, and a, uh, a welcome distraction. Uh, <clears throat> as you recall, Lissandra had a very weird way of speaking, um, almost as if, you know, common was not her tongue. Uh, with she did? Strange have... sort of... Wasn't that Stella or... Oh, sorry, that was Stella. Never mind. Yeah, Lissandra's the one that I rescued from the building during the CW pardon attack. Me, yeah. Pardon me. I was thinking it was Stella. No, you're right. Well, good catch to, to catch that on me. Uh, well, you would have run across Stella anyway. Uh, but Lissandra does seem to be somewhat interested in the Temple of Ignis. Um, she doesn't seem to be entirely a believer in the sort of sense that a true apprentice might be. Uh, but she might be open to to it, and at least be okay. able to perform some of the rituals, if you were to to train her. But you also get the sense that, in a, in a certain way, she's as attracted by your warmth as she is by Ignis's warmth. Right, right. Uh, and definitely has a little bit of, not exactly hero worship, but she does recognize and and believe you saved her life that day. And I'll look. Just subtly imply that she can be a hero too. I won't like force her to like. I won't be like a pressuring douchebag for her to join the <laughs> temple. But like, I'll just you know plant the seed in her head. Is that the uh, is that the poster? You can be a hero too. Light your inner fire. <laughs> join the Ignian. Join the Ignian League. <laughs> um, and the other the other thing is that people at first are a little bit taken aback by your very strange change. Um, because now your eyes, in fact, glow like candlelight uh, in a mild sense and can grow even larger if you're kind of following a bit of your emotional reactions. Um, mm -hmm. As you get angry, they'll flare a little bit darker red. Uh, as you are more at peace, they'll kind of dim down to a little bit of, of almost bluish um, flame. And it causes quite a stir. Uh, and you find that the, there's a bit of a... Of a of a of a story coming up about you, it feels like. Um, in fact, Silas, while, while Silas has been, uh, <laughs> I'm really helping carefully, <laughs> not including your name by uh, by direct uh, reference. Um, there are whispers as you as you go to certain places uh, of. Uh, remind me, uh, uh, Silas, what was the the euphemism or the name, the pseudonym you were giving to Medric? Oh crap! I forgot to write that down. My own stuff. I, th I think believe it's a phoenix. A phoenix something. Phoenix protector, uh, perhaps. I'm not sure. I don't have it right in front of me here. Yeah, it's on one of the various Facebook things. <laughs> uh, I think you included it in the uh, in the summary, which I have right in front of me here. So um, I will look for it. Yeah, uh, Phoenix Champion. A phoenix Champion. Um, which that that little legend is is getting Excellent. around, and while you know, I don't know whether you've denied it or not, but at the very least, uh, you know that people uh, every once in a while that you'll you'll catch somebody humming the tune, and then when you kind of enter the room, they they quiet up a little bit as if a little bit embarrassed. <laughs> Phoenix champion, never heard of him. <laughs> uh, so that means we have to make a tune, doesn't we? No, 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 Phoenix man. And your reputation just fell through the floor. I'll tell you some details offline, but the small temple will be granting you some free resources, basically, to do certain things in the future, especially if you have apprentices there, but you can take advantage of those as well. Um. For uh, your information, um, we have it kind of as an abstract feature right now, and you can use that as sort of a spendable resource. Mm -hmm. Or we can translate that right now into specific information that if you find a way to use, you will get a, a one-time bonus on. Um, would you like to translate that information right now? Uh, so you have if I don't... Two different pieces, one right about... Now. If you don't use it right now, then you can choose to use it later on. 
Uh, it just becomes a lot less strategic if you are trying to in the middle of something and the information is revealed and it's not really relevant to the situation. Uh, yeah, let's but, just use it right now then, or reveal it right now. Reveal it because right otherwise now. I will forget to use it. <laughs> okay. So the information you find out, uh, you had one for the diamond, one for Clockwinder, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Small yeah. information in both cases. Now, by, by revealing it, it no longer becomes a spendable resource, so keep that in mind. Okay. Um, but the uh, for the diamond, um, you talk to a number of people, and there's a mixed feeling about the diamond. Um, while definitely, if, when, as you're talking to people involved in the caravan trade or the merchants, there's a very negative feeling of the diamond. Uh, many of them have found themselves uh, having lost some parts of their caravan. It seems as though they don't they don't uh, take the entire caravan very often, and they don't usually kill most of the people involved. Uh, usually, it's just the guards or any hired uh, gun hired uh, uh, well guns, I suppose, but hired uh, mercenaries um, or anybody who who fights back uh, tends to die. Uh, but there has been some, if you will, polite exchanges almost. Uh, in fact, uh, some of the merchants and some of the, the, the people who were hired as uh, guards but did not fight uh, find it a little bit better than it used to be. Apparently, when the Diamond came in and established themselves as a leader of uh, what most have called a group of bandits, uh, they displaced an existing gang of bandits and thugs called Carver's Cutting Crew. They had a very, very dark reputation. They would not leave anybody alive in a caravan, but in fact uh, would uh, seek out and murder people in their homes. Uh, but since uh, they were being run by a former pirate named Edward Carver, um, and uh, since... The diamond has come in to the scene. The cutting crew seems to be operating a lot less, or at least some of the uh, the dangerous results of the cutting crew have uh, been reduced. They are still out there, and there are some very um, uh, disastrous sort of encounters. No one found alive. In fact, in those cases, the entire caravan was taken. Uh, and they believe it was the car the carving crew because they literally would carve a C into the bodies before they left and leave the bodies on the road. Okay, and they were run by Edward Carver? Or? Edward Carver, a former okay. pirate. Who had been operating this area for quite a while, not taking a lot of caravans. It would be something like taking a caravan every other month or something like that. Uh, but when they did, no one was left alive. Even the horses were slaughtered and left on the streets or left on the roads. So there's a certain sentiment that the diamond did a good job in coming in, but not if you talk to so the. He's like a lesser of two evils, basically. <laughs> it seems that way. Okay. So that's the information you find about the diamond. There's definitely some impact there, and that not in most importantly, the specifically about the diamond, uh, they tend to leave people mostly alive. Okay. Uh, and do not take entire caravans. About Clockwinder, or do you need a moment to write stuff down? I don't want to hold uh, you Just here. like two, 20 more seconds. <laughs> okay, no problem. Uh, I have uh, information also for uh, Annie, uh, because you had found out some information about the Baron. So uh, do you want to translate that now, uh, Annie, or do you want to hold on to it? Um, Part of me, the player, just wants to hold on to it until it's more relevant to what we're doing. Sure. So, the, the other thing that can happen, of... the other thing that can happen here, I didn't really get a chance to describe it before, but I did ask that when you look for information, you are looking for information about a topic or a subject or a place, a person, something like that. So it gives me, rather than a broad interpretation of what it is, you're actually going against something specific. The other thing that can happen in here is you can fish a little bit, which gives me an idea of the sort of information you're actually interested in about that about that person, place, or thing. So, for example, yeah. you could you could uh, say, well, I really want to know about, in the case of the Baron, it could be the Baron's history, the Baron's family, the Baron's estate. There's different directions you could go with that. Um, or if you don't have anything in particular in mind, I do have a set of facts that I've, I've put together, facts and rumors, uh, if you have any of those. So does that give you enough time, uh, Medrick, to yeah. get your notes in order? Let's talk about Clockwinder. Uh, hey. The note about Clockwinder is a lot briefer 
Um, Clockwinder came in on one of the caravans uh, with a load of goods. Um, the caravan was mostly, in fact, Clockwinder's own uh, crates of very heavy stuff. They were never opened in front of the people you talked to. You spent some time down by the docks talking to people about that. Um, and when the stuff was brought down to the docks, it was simply piled on the uh, edge of the docks. And the next day it was gone. The belief that they have, which is a little bit extended from the information, is that Clockwinder must have rented one of the warehouses down by the docks. But the people you talked to didn't know which one it was. Rented a warehouse down by the docks? That's right, but you don't know which one. Because otherwise that, that stuff couldn't, you know, couldn't have been loaded on a ship. There was no ships heading out at that time. Uh, and doesn't have, uh, it was all down there by the docks and too heavy to have lifted back up to town. Also specifically brought down to the docks by Clockwinder. Um, the other part you get for free, Clockwinder was very creepy. Universally, everybody you talk to him about, talk to uh, uh, them says uh, that Clockwinder was just weird. And I have to check to see here. Um, Did they say creepy in what way? Um, basically, he never seemed to treat people like people. Everything was an object to him. And you do get a name, or at least a partial name. Uh, mm -hmm. As you're familiar, gnomes tend to have a lot of names, and then they tend to have a short name that they're known by. In this case, he's known as Farven the Clockwinder. So F A R V E N. You don't know the rest of his name? Gnome names tend to have six to ten different parts. But Farvin the Clockwinder was the way that others introduced him, and then people just started referring to him as the Clockwinder. Okay. He did, in fact, have a small box that he carried with him, and the small box, uh, partially the, everybody called it a clock, but it didn't look like a clock that anybody recognized. But periodically throughout the day, he would wind up the clock, or insert a key and start winding up the box. They would make all kinds of strange noises and sounds on the inside. Strange. It's another reason that people sort of thought he was just weird. And, and it made a bunch of like different sounds every time or? It wasn't necessarily different sounds every time, but it didn't make any sort of consistent chime or anything like that. Okay. So, Annie, you're holding on to your information. Yep. Um, for Silas, the sculptor you found is a 16-year-old boy. He's part of the cult. Named Dogal Barrett, D O G A L uh, B A R R E T T. Okay. He is your second cousin, twice removed. Um, and his parents, Nessa and George Barrett, are still within the cult. Dogal okay. was uh, sick a couple of years ago. Uh, kind of deathly ill so he could not actually fish he was bedridden for the summer and took up whittling uh, at that point he found a true passion for it since then he's been known to carve a lot of useful things out of wood and is starting to apprentice actually for furniture building in town as well so he lives part time with his parents in the, uh, in the uh, marsh town uh, and part time with his master in town uh, Nichetto Ohms Okay. Who is a uh, furniture maker. 
uh, Dogal is. A, I can. I'll send you the information as well. So um, mm -hmm. you don't necessarily have to tell yeah. all this if you want. Uh, yeah, well, I'll get when I review the episode yeah. anyway. Oh, that too. Okay. Uh, he is uh, average height for his age. He is only 16. He is a little slim for his age, but well muscled, especially in his arms and in his hands. Uh, he has a light olive skin with green undertones and thick, strong fingers. Uh, very nimble. And he's just starting to grow a beard, which is uh, his mother has constantly told him to shave off. Um, he has wide set blue green eyes and small ears uh, and sloppy short brown hair. So that gives you a visual image. But he does definitely have the family look, which you can look mm -hmm. at because you're around it all the time and you can notice it in town. Um, but he definitely has that sort of uh, the look of the family, basically. Although he fits yeah. in relatively well, being um, kind of a bit farther removed. Okay. All right. So let us say that you've reconvened back at the Three Bells. You've gathered for uh, a bit of, of dinner. You can choose to figure out why for yourself. <laughs> uh, but uh, do you have anything you want to talk about with each other? Maybe make your plans. Um, well, first of all, uh, there were a few questions I had posted on the private one. Uh, just questions about, uh, like, how is the town treating us now that we went out to stop the storm and then the storm stopped and we came back? Um, right. Like, are we getting known in the town? Um, how obvious are you being with your tales? <laughs> it doesn't even necessarily have to be the tales. I mean, when we left the three bells, we said, yeah, we're going to go handle this. Uh, hopefully we make it back. And then it gets handled and we come back right after. Um, what a coincidence. <laughs> sure, just a coincidence. No, no, no need to. No. Um, gonna... Coinciding. <laughs> All right. I mean, he doesn't use names in the tales, but there's anyone who's around People... much is going to pick up on the fact that we're doing stuff to help the town at some point. I have your questions in front, so I'll, I'll address those. I'm sorry I meant to before. No uh, problem. So, yes, uh, word is coming out about town. Um, you're becoming more and more recognized. Um, two of you in particular. Um, Silas, you've been an entertainer in this town for a while, so you've got a little bit of a reputation. Uh, but Further to the song that you're presenting as well, probably playing in a couple of different places, um, people are starting to recognize you partially as the teller of the tale. Um, so there's a little bit of distance from the actual events in that case, uh, but also uh, being uh, uh, a bit more respected. Um, if you want to, you can charge a bit more for your services as one of the results that come out of that. Um, but it does uh, seem to be fairly favorable. Uh, even Wish, at one point, doesn't sneer when he passes by you, uh, which for him is a relatively uh, uh, a large leap. No surprise cock punch. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, it's kind of the thing when you drop off Nicky once in a while so that uh, he can stay with that set of, of grandparents. Uh, uh, he's not exactly chatty, because Wish is never chatty, but um, the sort of thing about... about uh, uh, there would be a sort of backwards implied thank you uh, that comes from him. Uh, and he does kind of ask you about how well the things he's made for you uh, are working, kind of uh, as, a, as a way to, to check in on you. Um, as for uh, Medric, another fairly recognizable figure in town, um, there's a lot of chatter about the temple itself and a lot of chatter about how... Um, a lot more confidence has returned to the town because it feels like the town has gained a true protector. Um, it is a little bit at the cost of Verendel's own reputation. verendel has been here for a while, but he's been struggling to kind of maintain um, the, the law and order. Even now, it's still somewhat difficult uh, with the additional people that he has gotten since then. Um, but to a certain degree, Medric's own um, recognition is growing a lot more. And there are a lot of people checking in on the temple's progress, if not necessarily directly uh, helping. And in mm -hmm. fact, um, for the grand revealing of the temple, it draws a pretty sizable crowd, uh, like 50 people actually show up 
uh, nice. approximately to see uh, what it's like. Even in the back, you can note uh, uh, the Chamberlain uh, kind of taking note of it as well and clapping mildly um, for the success. Um, Chamberlain, is that the tax guy? Uh, Chamberlain is, uh, well, sort of. There was another tax guy, but his name has gotten forgotten, so I've, I've written down this Chamberlain's name. So from now on out, probably will be the person dealing with the taxes uh, as the... Uh, but as yeah, a religious I organization, you by that, that have that taxes, or, right? I have worked that one time. <laughs> uh, I, I think I heard both of you. Uh, <laughs> but yes, uh, the, the other one, uh, the name Midrick is still on the rolls, mind you, uh, but they're just having a hard time locating Midrick. Uh, but Chamberlain Aknarada, um, who is in fact a, a half elf with fairly prominent elf features, uh, a, uh, a uh, you know kind of larger pointed ears that the elves have, a bit of a more uh, bluish tone in their uh, in their uh, uh, skin tone, uh, but tends to be uh, fairly cold and unemotional, um, and uh, uh, a bit distant. Um, even when announcing the festival and trying to uh, drum up, you know, the joy about it, there's a certain creak that can almost be heard in the smile that uh, Aknarada tried to produce while giving that positive news. Uh, and going around town, essentially, not exactly like a town crier, but checking in with a lot of local establishments and kind of letting the word be heard, uh, leaving behind uh, uh, a, uh, a few small uh, handwritten pamphlets. Yeah, written with a very nice hand. So um, uh, for the Temple of Ignis, because uh, it's a religious organization, does it have to pay taxes, or do we have to pay taxes? Uh, did the pre all, did uh, Flamekeeper Tidewell have to pay taxes? Yes. yes. Damn it! Uh, all so all it doesn't people, work like in real life. Uh, in this particular not modern case, day real life. Yeah. In this particular <laughs> case, uh, it would seem that the taxes are determined by two things: citizenry and ownership. Uh, because you are now in town and you have a building, you are now considered a citizen. Uh, and because you own a building, you have ownership. So you're actually taxed twice. God damn it. Um, the, uh, the citizenry tax is lower. Uh, the the uh, other tax, um, you don't know how much it's going to be, um, but you do. You have heard that the taxes have, had been going up. Um they but quadrupled. <laughs> generally, yeah. the, the, the taxes for a business are higher. Uh, okay. But if you do take in alms, you might be considered a business. Um, so, yes, word is spreading around town. Um, word of Annie has spread a little bit, but not as much. And I suspect that Annie is probably keeping a little bit lower profile or not looking like she's going to be in the in the spotlight. So there's sort of there's that there's that uh, what was it the the uh, uh, the Phoenix champion. Um, what does Silas refer to himself as in these stories or does he? He's the shadowy wizard, shadowy wizard. So the the uh, Phoenix champion, the shadowy wizard. And the lady is kind of the third, the third title. But um, while some of the uh, people know directly who it was uh, because they dealt with Annie directly, uh, for the most part, um, Annie doesn't, unless Annie wants to take advantage of that reputation, I suspect that she's trying to keep a low profile as usual. Uh, right now but, she kind of is, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I kind of answered a little bit of the question of uh, Captain Verandell. Verandell is, is seen as, as hardworking, but not necessarily effective. Um, and you suspect that it's in part because um, the people he's working with, in part because he's so focused on keeping the town safe, he could not have gone out against and deal with these, these outside threats. Um, so he could not have gone after the spout. He didn't know anything about the control stuff. Uh, do you actually talk about the controls that were below in the sewers? Sorry, what controls in the sewers? So you went through the sewers to end up in... Oh, the machinery? The machinery, yeah. Um, it would have at least been vaguely there. Not anything super specific, but just there was something there that was uh, like a a thing in a, in a, uh, a, bit, like a cage that we fought and... 
So something similar, but just not so much detail on what it actually was. Do you mention that it's in the like... sewers? Um, he probably would not mention the sewers specifically, just that uh, we gained access uh, underground and were whisked away to this place to fight this thing. Okay. It's also very dangerous, and every now and then the place floods with acid, so don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, make a deception roll, Silas. Suspense. Okay, 15. Um, you kind of are cagey about where this actually happened, but you do notice that as the story starts to spread, um, you notice that additional uh, protections have been placed on the entrances to the sewer, um, almost as though they're expecting the word to get out, get out or they're trying to get ahead of it, and have started to add you know, heavy, heavier, um, heavier bars, heavier locks, uh, and they probably have changed the keys since then. Good. Maybe that'll fix the diamond using it locking people uh so that was verandel uh, verandel does seem to be a little more relaxed in some ways now that his town's not being bombarded with water large stones and occasionally uh, uh sea devils um but there 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 were in the week in the couple of weeks that followed the end of that there were a lot of petty squabbles. And so he and his guards had to break up fights. There were, there were some looting going on. There were places that were smashed and kind of left open and, uh, and people were taking advantage of that. So there was a bit of scramble for two or three weeks after that. Um, but in part helped by the hard work that he did, but in part helped by the fact that um, so many people were hired by the Baron to help fix up the town. Um, a lot of that started to get uh, get mitigated. Um, as for the clan treating Silas, um, there is uh, now the very common uh, greeting for Silas when he enters the, the clan's area that they call him Harbinger. In fact, almost no one calls him Silas anymore. That includes Odega and Athanos, who now use that title for him, um, you can make an insight check. You mean I can try to make an insight check? I mean, <laughs> it's always trying. Well, that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, Odega and Athanos uh, both sort of use the title, not exactly ironically, but a little bit reluctantly. Almost as though they they've sensed in in many ways the direction that the tide is turning, which would be a very familiar expression among a, a clan of fishers. Uh, Athenos is spending more and more time out fishing and doesn't spend as much time with the people, but Odega is always there, and you get the sense that she still is is working very hard to uh, to keep her relevance to the clan in the forefront of everyone's minds. Um, so even yeah. even the stories that are being told about the Harbinger, she's in charge of those stories when you're not around. And they find them they're a little bit aggrandized from what you had uh, actually done. Um, and you can tell there's sort of additional elements being added to the story, but at this point you're not exactly sure why those elements were added. Sure. Uh, and are the townspeople in general reacting well or poorly to the new Temple of Ignis? Um, very well. In fact, it seems almost as though the rebuilding of the Temple of Ignis is one of those symbols that people are using as a sign that things are getting better. Um, and one of the things that Medric would have discovered, and, and Silas and Annie also in your, in your talking to people, is that although not very many people went to the Temple of Ignis as a worshiper. A lot of people came to the Flame Keeper um, as a wise person. Oh, fuck. <laughs> so they really, really, really respected her. 
And some stories start to come out a little bit about the last stand of the Flame Keeper. And in fact, Silas, while you're not you're you're a bard, you're not the only bard in town. In fact, there's another couple of them that are trying to make a couple of coins about the events that are coming up. The stories as you experience them are not exactly the same stories as these bards are coming up with, so the veracity of these stories is a little bit uh, questionable. But the last stand of the Flame Keeper uh, talks about how, and, and puts it in almost a play-like terms, where uh, she stood boldly in front of uh, the, the, the Everflame and uh, stood against the storm itself uh, and, and, and stood up to the storm itself until in the end she was overwhelmed but the Everflame, and here's the kind of line which gets back to Medrick as well, the Everflame cannot be extinguished. It merely uh, rests for a time. And that sort of sentiment starts to grow a little bit in the town where there's a sort of sense and now an expectation uh, on Medrick, not only that the Everflame will return, but also that Medrick will be able to step into some of that, uh, that sort of guidance and elder role that the flamekeeper had. Now, obviously, Medrick is not nearly as as old as the flamekeeper was. It's uh, the weekly advice column with Medrick. <laughs> <laughs> but you're starting to get that sense of people looking up to you. Now, what you do with that, that's up to you. You can try to change the narrative. You can try to work into the narrative. You can try to live up to the narrative. You can deny the narrative. That's up to you. But that's what's happening right now. What does the fire say? The fire says, handle your own problems. Okay. <laughs> Preferably with a hammer. No. <laughs> the the magic, magic, magic ball. Shake it and it says, go away. You're on, good luck. You're on your Throw own. Throw a hammer at it. A flaming hammer. It's called the Medric missile. <laughs> shake it, shake it, shake it. Have you tried fire? Shake it, shake it, shake it. Have you tried a hammer? Shake it, shake it, shake it. Have you tried a flaming hammer? No, well, I can't help you. <laughs> <laughs> Come back in a week. Um, so that catches up a little bit. Any other questions or, or thoughts about uh, the the changes that have happened, or any other um, uh, concerns or ideas uh, about what has happened? And you can you can come up to them a little bit later if you want, but we'll try to move a little bit forward. So the three of you gather at the three bells, and in what has now kind of become your table, to the point now where um, when. Uh, one of you comes into the room. Uh, Sandy kind of ushers people away from that table. Uh, maybe a little quicker than they were than they were meaning to be. Looks like they weren't. They were, you know, people were planning to linger spot. a little bit more. But uh, it's a comfortable spot, uh, not far from the fire, in sort of the back corner of the room where you tended to gather anyway. It's harder you find... to hear when you're in the back of the room. Yeah. <laughs> um. And you also find yourselves not really paying for meals at the Three Bells anymore. Food just sort of arrives, uh, and they just keep bringing it until you say, tell them not to. Um, it doesn't. It's the Three Bells has never had a huge variety, so you're not getting anything different than anybody else is. But you're also getting it without even having to ask, unless you turn it away. Nice. Um, so yeah, um, okay, so was our special table near the back of the room, you said? Yep. Okay. That's probably good. Um, yeah, I guess after we're eating, or after we start eating, um, Silas will just quietly say, uh, I've been thinking about the seed mm -hmm. and where it... it. Sorry? Have you found a spot for it? There are two I can think of. The, the most difficult thing is smoke. If we're supposed to keep it away from that, then there's not a lot of places. But... There are two I can think of. The first would be just outside my clan's area, 
we only have a few houses, so there isn't much smoke. We can plant it in the trees off uh, near the coast. It's said that there needed to be children around, and we do have a number of children living there that are ours. We did not kidnap them. <laughs> um, completely <laughs> free range children. Um, it it fits pretty much everything, uh, but I mean, the cult is the cult. So, I mean, it's I don't Could know. You trust your family to not mess with the seed. My close family, yes. My aunt and uncle, I don't know. And I'm not sure how the mother would feel about it. Um, the other option is at the lighthouse. That that was the first place that came to mind for me as well, was the lighthouse. It lighthouse fits, or uh, the temple it, where we found Catherine. Although that's, mm, there's no... Well, uh, that one's inland. It has to be a place where the water comes in and leaves. So it's got to be somewhere on the coast. There's got to be children around. There can't be much for smoke, or if any. Um, the lighthouse fits most of that as well. Um, it's not... I mean, one advantage of the clan is that the clan could help protect it, if necessary. Um with the lighthouse, there'll be less interference, but let's face it, they're not going to be able to protect it if something happens. Um, but there are children there, and there's only what what smoke comes out of their, their uh, chimney, uh, their stovepipe at the, at the lighthouse. So I think it would be another good option so i just wanted to mention them now so people uh, so you can think about it more because Namti did say that the sooner we plant it the sooner it can help us so yeah. if we don't have to have it planted right now we'll probably want to plant it as soon as we can um, um I, I will say didn't the people at the lighthouse say that like nobody ever goes that way? Uh, pretty much, but then they were raided by sea devils. Yes, uh, but that was an anomaly. Hopefully, um, I mean, we didn't defeat the sea devils. They still uh, have the star stone, the big star stone. Uh, no, uh, the lighthouse has the star stone. Yeah, uh, so. Oh, we didn't this, recover it, though. They... Uh, I think it fell into the water. Didn't no, we it? did. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right, right. Yeah, it was we like extinguished. Thing. Gotcha. But, but it, it was a lot smaller uh, now. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's that's part of the thing is that the stone that they wanted is, is back where they last stole it from. Uh, hopefully the sea devils are going to be too scared to try it again, but... Um, I mean, and if the both places have positive have no use for it. Yeah, I mean, both places have positives and negatives. I think the lighthouse is the nicer place, but given the different factions that seem to be operating here, uh, it's also the place we would have the least ability to protect it. Um, but I mean, I'll go with whatever you guys think is is better. I can't think of any other place other than those two. Uh, that would fit the requirements. Um, Me either. But so we, far, who who else knows we have the seed? Nobody. Nobody. Not even Gaetano. Gaetano knows. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but he did, knows not to tell anybody, right? Presumably, <laughs> unless the king and queen ask him directly. He, he, he wouldn't tell anyone that does not need to know. Yeah. Not so. The further we plant it out of town, the further it will be from anybody who yeah well, well, if nobody knows about it i think should it, be fine at the lighthouse yeah i mean like i said i mean i i mean i think it's like where we have it now which he specifically does not say uh, out loud 
uh, I think, yeah, it would be protected by its obscurity. But at the same time, if we're if there's supposed to be laughing children around it, then it's got to be close enough to the lighthouse that the children are probably going to find it. I mean, that kid goes exploring all over the place. He's going to notice the big seashell that we have to cover it in. Um, so they may have to be in on it. Yeah. Um, well, they have to, yeah. But they also don't really leave yeah. the lighthouse either. I mean, let's say, I think I think that's I think it's a good option. Uh, I don't I don't think anywhere else in town is going to fit it because there's there's too much smoke in a town, um, and it can't be inland. So yeah, and the uh, the lighthouse would have less smoke as well because it's just yeah. the one building. Yeah, and it's just the one family, so there it's not going to be much there. So if we plant it a little ways away, it should be fine. Like like I think if we plant it in the woods like say like five or ten feet back in the woods away from the the edge uh, uh, like from the coastline um i mean that'll keep it from seeing the smoke and getting scared so um all we really have to do for that now is find a really big oyster yep with the pearl in it yeah um, I'll I'll see what I can do about that. Um, Wait, okay. didn't we find a pearl necklace somewhere? Yeah, but I think this has to be a, this is going to have to be a lot bigger. At least the shell is going to have to be big. Um, but did a uh, Nomti specify whether the pearl had to be from the oyster, or could we just add it from a necklace? I don't remember, but it given the ritual nature of this. I'd say probably it would have to be one, the same thing. The pearl might not have to be massive. I mean, you could have a huge oyster that just has a beginning pearl in it. But um, I can... Um, just I as can... a reminder, you do have a document in Roll20 called Nomtis yeah, Guide I got it to open. Planting as a Munda, So <laughs> Yeah, I was trying to remember where I put the rules last time. Uh And as for the particular rule, the seed must be planted in an intact shell of a great silver mollusk with the pearl still inside, too. Ah, uh, it's that still word that screws us up. Yeah. Damn it. Okay. <laughs> Technicalities. Um, I, mean, I can I can check with the pearl divers at some point. They're not normally going to go for anything that big, but uh, I can go down there and bring one up if there's one there but uh, i mean it won't be right away but um if you guys feel that the the lighthouse is the better place to plant it then that's that's something we should keep in mind next time we're out there because um, we'll have to go out there every week to feed it seaweed anyways yeah and uh, how close do the children have to be playing i imagine like build, build them a I imagine, playground i imagine it's going to be able to hear them so it does say although it if it is covered in salt water, it feeds. It will feed itself. Ah, okay. Hmm. So yeah, maybe we can find a little marsh area at the coast. That would work. Um, for your assistance as well, I added a regional map of the area with labels. Um, you'll find that under your handouts in Roll20 as well. Um, it's oh, kind of a little not vague, my computer. Cool. but uh, it does show you where the different forests are, the Valds, uh, Demthurum, which is the uh, large mountain chain uh, off there, uh, and the approximate location of where the Lonely Tree Island was, which is, not, is kind of not too far away from the lighthouse in a certain relative sense. Right. The exact location of that is not really known. Uh, sorry, the location of what's not the known? lonely the lonely tree island. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not really a specific location. Yeah. Okay, yeah, because I was going to ask if uh, Mar if the uh, the Marsh Clan holdings could be put on there too. So that's yeah, good. They are, yeah. They are, yeah. Um. So what I'll do is I'll actually switch to the uh, the map page just so that people at home can also see. Um, what this looks like. 
No, of course it's not going to see it. <laughs> we see water. Yeah, it's because it's a pop up. I'll switch it. Um. Okay, the side says that. I mean, I think uh, we've probably got that uh, decided. That I'll see what I can do about finding a uh, a great silver mollusk. <clears throat> yeah, it doesn't really give us size, so I'll just assume that anything that's really big and out of the ordinary will probably be enough. Um, okay, Silas will keep that in mind for later then. Um, so, um, has anyone talked to, oh, I have her name somewhere. Is that uh, Sable recently? Sable has not tried to reach out to any of you uh, in the intervening month. I think what you did last tell her to do was to stay there. Yeah. And wait to be contacted, more or less. Uh, yeah, well, we told her if she, uh, to take notes on what was happening, but uh, but yeah. So he looks over at Annie and says, uh, how do we want to handle this? Well, there is that that party. Yeah. Um, I think that being able to go to that would probably be a good way to at least to see her. Mm -hmm. And that way we can pass a message to her. Yeah. Uh, do we know where they're holding that? Is that at the castle, or is that at the, some wealthy place in town? The party will be at uh, Cape Raven. We'll be at the Baron's estate. Nice. Because that might also... actually get to see the Baroness, or if she's going to be walking around with curtains around her. It is by invite only. Did, did we get an invite? We don't. No, we're not rich. Jump to you. Um, however, we can probably work towards maybe getting an invite, uh, if, uh, we have some coffee and such that the caterers might, uh, need, or at least get, maybe we can go in with the caterers. Um, yeah. I might be able to arrange to be one of the, the entertainers there that would get me in. I can see uh, with uh, the captain if I can get in somehow. You could be a guard, perhaps. Exactly. Uh, do you think he could take me on as a guard as well? Maybe uh, mean, also if uh, accidents happen, you know, with that many drunk nobles, you never know. I can help make people feel better. It's not a common occurrence, I would say. <laughs> I just come kind of standing outside the door. Good thing I happen to be here when someone cut their finger. Look at that! I just happen to be here. <laughs> several, uh, you know, several miles here from town. Because um, keep in mind that Cape Raven is quite a distance uh, around Silver Move Bay. Um, it actually takes a, a couple of hours just to get there. It's not a casual trip. Well, it took us forty-five minutes last time we were going. Um, well, yeah, actually, I suppose. Yeah, That's about an hour. Was on horseback. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, you could try to just assume that you would be allowed in as the uh, the head of the uh, the head of the temple. Um, maybe try to throw some uh, religious weight around. Maybe. Possibly. Have the uh, invites already been sent? Or can we, we still work on getting by this By this point, probably, because that was like a month ago they mentioned it. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, I can see. As long as one of us can get in, as much as I'd prefer all of us being able to be there, as one of it, as long as one of us can get in and can contact her, that's the important part. Yeah, I can contact her, it's, but it's not very many words. I mean, if if it comes down to it, I can make a couple of us invisible for an hour. And that's fair. Again. Um, or, and just for like six seconds, uh, he looks like Captain Verendel, and then he looks like Silas again. Um, I can always do that too. I'm assuming Verendel got an invite and got invited. That's part because I can see if I can go as Verendel's date. Hey, that's a good idea. <laughs> Um, at this point, Annie, you would know that um, Verendel hasn't mentioned having an invite, but you're not really sure if mm -hmm. he has or not because you haven't really asked him about it. Yeah. I've also not been around. I worked that, that first week and then kind of went on and did my own thing. Yeah. So. And he was quite busy during those next couple of weeks where there were disputes. Hmm. Who would we talk to if we were looking for invites? Like, is there anyone in town of rank, or would we have to go up to the castle? I mean, you could probably try to go to the castle, but not really having a way in. It's kind of like, how do you get the invite to get the invite? Um, there are a number of wealth, wealthy merchants in town. Um, there's also the beginnings of what you, you've heard of kind of as a fisher's union, um, which is they're trying to get together. Uh, you've heard about it specifically, Silas, because they're trying to do that to bring some pressure to cut as much of the Marsh Clan out of the fishery as possible uh, because they're having a harder time fishing and not gathering as much. So there's a bit of power gathering there uh, backed by one of the... Uh, the uh, warehouse owners, one of the sort of fish processing areas, if you will. Um, there are also a number of wealthy merchants um, who uh, who have uh, been sort of managing por uh, uh, access through the port, uh, and they are likely the ones on the main list. Um, there's even a, a couple of builders who have now kind of created a, a, um, a company of builders and are well known for expensive work. Um, the one of the ones that you actually know of directly um, is uh, shoot, where's his name? Uh, da, da, da. Sorry, Lawrence. Uh, no, Lawrence is just a builder. Uh, Nichetto Ohms, the uh, person to whom Dogol is actually an apprentice. Um, he's a he's a furniture maker, and he makes high quality furniture out of uh, Totenwald wood, um, which is known to have sort of a very um, beautiful texture if you can if you can work with it, uh, and ships out a lot of furniture and has a, a kind of a, a fairly well-known name in, in town. Uh, and then uh, as you're kind of discussing this, um, you, the, you hear the, the door kind of swing open in the uh, three bells, and another person comes in who you actually would put on that list as well. Uh, a wealthy merchant, na merchant named Ardwin Cartwright. Um, a sort of late middle age to uh, early uh, elder uh, human. Uh, very well dressed. Always seems to be very well dressed in a much different f uh, fashion from what's uh, usually worn here. Uh, dressing up way too much for uh, what would be typical here as well. Uh, has a number of, of uh, golden rings on his uh, very thick fingers, uh, wears a very stylish hat, uh, comes into the three bells through the door and kind of steps in and, and sort of makes a point while he's scanning around the room 
of of uh, of st- not stamping a little bit, but sort of brushing his feet back and forth as if to to get the mud or the dust from outside off as soon as he comes in. Um, but he sort of looks down at the floor and um, there's an expression that crosses his face of, oh, why bother? It's just as bad in here. Um, steps in a little bit and then stepping behind him uh, is the other very common sight along with Ardwin. Uh, this very, very tall, very pale-skinned woman um, who stands almost as tall as the ceiling in the Three Bells at this particular point. So, uh, you know, close to seven feet, if not actually seven feet. Uh, very muscular, um, has a you know, sort of short, dark hair, a little, little fluff on top. Always has a very serious look on her face. Uh, and that's known to be Lild, um, his bodyguard. Um, kind of steps in, steps up to the bar, and Ardwin is another one of these people um, who you would have on that list. Ardwin speaks for a few moments, uh, kind of having looked around the room. Pauses a little bit on your table. Um, you see kind of pauses mostly on Medric uh, because of the, the natural glow that Medric has. He sort of stands out in any semi-dim room, including this one. Speaks and mm-hmm. says something to uh, to Sandy, which you don't hear from here. Drops a couple of coins on the, on the, uh, uh, the, t- the top of the bar. Um, which she kind of looks at a little bit suspiciously, but then gestures over in your direction um, to the to your table, uh, and kind of catching your eye, Silas, because you're watching the door, uh, and Annie as well. There's a sort of apologetic um, shrug from Sandy. Um, I, I, a... I like <laughs> <laughs> Silas. Just quietly says, just high enough for the other two to hear. Someone like him is what we need. That's our way in. Who's that guy? I mentioned who his name was. Yeah, Arwen Cartwright. Cartwright. Um, he is a he is a merchant. He doesn't have a, a, an establishment in town as such. Um, it's been said that he owns two or three of the actual merchant shops in town. Uh, and controls a, a, a lot of trade uh, coming through the port and out through the caravans. And he looks filthy rich. Gotcha. He definitely looks very rich. And he puts on, as uh, both Annie and Silas notice, uh, a very, very welcoming smile. Uh, and then trots over I sit the up table. straighter and put on a, like, business face. <laughs> My clothes all suddenly seem... Uh, better cleaned and better quality than they did a second ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he kind of walks over to the table. Only a few steps behind him is Lild, um, who at one point just reaches over to one of the tables, grabs one of the drinks, and, and drinks it very, very quickly. No one says a word. Um, she seems terribly frightening to most. And in fact, um, you can see uh, a very large, very heavy, very crude-looking a uh, warhammer strapped across her back. Um, its uh, its head is probably about the size of Medric's head. To give you a comparison, um, if Sandy's still looking in our direction, Silas will catch her look and point towards where the drink was, and go one there. He's trying to say he'll replace the drink. Okay. <laughs> uh, Sandy kind of, uh, you know, has the has the frown that she had left over from watching what happened with Lild, and it kind of gets transferred to you. But then when she catches or you catch her eye, um, she kind of winks and then uh, nods, and busily uh, starts uh, pouring a new drink for the uh, the poor unfortunate. But Ad, uh, Ardwin makes a, a beeline straight for your table, kind of pushing around, and. You both notice pretty easily. I'm kind of assuming, I don't know why, in my mental picture of this, that Medric's back Bulldoze. is to the door. But Andy is <laughs> definitely watching the front door, and Silas is kind of keeping an eye on the crowd. Uh, but Medric is kind of I unconcerned. always have an eye on the door. I yeah. always have an eye on how to get out of somewhere. So that's my mental picture. Is how <laughs> yeah, Medric would too, though, just because, like, having been in the military before, like, you always want to look at the door. Yeah. So I, I might be like, if my chair, if I'm on the side of the table, that's back to the door, I, my, my chair would be like shifted sideways like this. Okay. Every five minutes we just change chairs. We just keep rotating. Musical chairs! <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, but Arwen, uh, as I said, kind of makes his way through. And, and what you notice in some ways is that he's, he's picking his way carefully through the room. Uh, it's almost as though he's trying to stay at least a hand's breadth away from any other chair uh, or anybody, especially any other occupant in one of the chairs. Um, and you know that this crowd is not exactly the most well-known for their, let's say, excessive hygiene. Um, and that may be what he's sort of reacting to, uh, <laughs> but a lot more, a lot less politely, perhaps, than <laughs> what most people would would do. But he is being subtle. He has about showered it, and washed his clothes it's, it's, at the uh, temple. Well, eventually, oh, the temple has a hot bath too. Well, I mean, you can make it a hot bath. That's not. That's not <laughs> um, eventually, Medric will just burn off all the dirt anyway. So. Um, <laughs> But uh, he approaches the table with that very large smile and kind of uh, turns and catches each of you with his eyes and, and, and uh, kind of nods. Um, you do notice a little bit of nervousness in catching Medric's eyes because they are a little bit unnerving to a lot of people. Uh, the uh, fact that they are sort of a, a pure uh, color of light. Mark, hmm. uh, there's something Silas would like to do just about six seconds before the guy is getting, okay. like just as he's coming in. Sure. Um, cast major image centered on us but nothing looks different uh however it can handle temperature sounds and smells okay uh, so the area around us as he sits down is going to smell nicer uh okay. and cleaner and whatnot as he sits down to help put him at ease uh and is... uh, make him feel more amenable to us as one of the more uh, uh, odd uses for major image, I, I like it a lot. Um, let me just check one thing real quick. Set here. the mood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it covers a twenty foot cube, I believe. Uh, it does. It does have, uh, both a vocal a, and a somatic. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, he's going to be speaking into his uh, dinner. Okay, let's let's call this a sleight of hand roll then to kind of do it without being noticed. Sure. Okay, not a great roll. Um, yeah, so it's true. clear it's clear that you did something, but as soon as the illusion yeah. takes in, into effect, it's kind of washed away. I will. Um, uh, I got to remember which window I'm looking in here. Let's just see here how well he does in kind of noticing. Okay, um, you 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 get the sense that he he saw what happened. Uh, and he hesitates for only a half second, but as soon as he steps into sort of the area of the illusion, uh, you can kind of see that uh, it's relaxed him somewhat. You don't know whether he knows that that is an illusion or not, but yeah. but uh, at the very least, uh, he seems to be a little bit more impressed um, with the area. He sits down. Uh, Lild does not sit down. Lild kind of stands beside the table, more or less looming over one quarter of the table uh, and kind of assessing each of you. Uh, Lild's eyes pass very quickly over Annie, um, looks at Silas without really much much uh, uh, of a thought, but lingers on Medric for a little while. And you get the impression, Medric, there's sort of that, huh, you look like you'd be fun in a fight. Uh, but there's a more um, stoic expression. As, as he's sitting down, I was... Uh, I would like to say, you look like a man on, on a mission. What can we do to, for you? Also, uh, is Lild human or elven or half-orc? Um, Lild would be under the uh, the sort of standard d and parlance a... Um, uh, wow, I've just lost the, the term. Um, Goliath. Gotcha. Um, and for the players... Um, she has a very similar size and shape in many ways to Paul from the original campaign. Right. Who was, who was also a Goliath, but it never really came up that way. No, he was human. No, we didn't. We never uh, did. <laughs> he, Goliaths are actually human in my, in my world. They just happen to all come from a certain uh. area, and they happen to have inherited great traits. Um, they are lords. Other, otherwise, they're completely, <laughs> they're completely human to me. Um, but yes, uh, and she has very, uh, you know, well-pronounced muscles. The, the, the shirt that she's wearing uh, is uh, kind of very plain, but um, especially for, for, for Medric, um, who's kind of getting a bit of the, the passive gun show, um, there, there's a very clear intent because the shirt has no sleeves, 
but you can kind of see around the edge where it probably did have sleeves at one point that were pulled off. Um, <laughs> so she's very deliberately kind of kind of uh, uh, expressing this, which in a bodyguard is probably not a bad trait. Um, yeah. And I would realize that, and I'll just like nod. And there's an ever so slight look nod at as well, Ardwin yeah. after. So Ardwin, yes, kind of strode over, and uh, after smiling at all of you and stepping into the delightful floral illusion, um, did proceed to just sit down without actually uh, introducing himself. But uh, you kind of get the impression there's a sort of uh, uh, this sort of if you don't know him or if you know him, you'd know to expect him sort of like this. I don't know how to put that exactly. But he does, uh, with his bright smile, uh, kind of look around the table. I've been Mr. told, I've been told that you are the people to talk to about problems that need solving. And I happen to have a problem I'd really, really appreciate having solved. Oh, that depends. We've uh, solved many problems so far. What problem do you have? Uh, so I hear... Uh, the tale of the Phoenix Champion is quite amusing. I hope that the story isn't too exaggerated from what I've been delighted in hearing. I'll look at Silas like, what have you done? <laughs> <laughs> I can assure you that if you have heard uh, the original version that I wrote, it is not uh, anything at all from the truth. I cannot say for those for others who are uh... repeating it. Yes. <laughs> ah, well, stories have a way of of making their way around. I'm sure that some unfavorable tales have been told about me over time from disgruntled and somewhat petty abusers of my good nature. But enough of that. Proof of you being here is enough for me. Besides, I've seen the delightful temple you've been forging. Um, I'm not familiar with your title, but I, I understand Flamekeeper is in order? Uh, I don't know if I'd be calling myself Flamekeeper just yet. Eventually. Ah, modesty. A rare commodity, indeed. But what I'm here to ask your favor in is in dealing with a very annoying petty thief who calls himself the Diamond. Oh, what is he stolen? We've uh, had encounters with him. Are you trying not to be swayed by his charms, Annie? I see Charisma save. No, I'm trying not to snicker <laughs> <laughs> at the at oh, his yeah. comment. Um... As a, a, a person of business who's frequently bringing goods in and out of this town, uh, many, many caravans to travel back and forth along the King's Road and others, and of course, uh, through the delightful port, now that that nasty business of the uh, bothersome storm is done with, of course, but as someone who brings business back and forth and makes a lot of money for this town, it seems somewhat unfortunate that the town's guard are not extended out towards the road, presenting me and mine with certain difficulties. And I will tell you I've lost more than one caravan to that... <sighs> penniless diamond... And I am in interested in no longer learn losing any money. And again, from what I hear, you might just be the people to get this done. I would have thought that you would have been able to, uh, and he'll look a little bit at Lild, uh, been able to hire guards to guard your caravans if that's what you need. I have. My personal security is not involved in this. Too many people have vengeance or petty theft in their mind in town, so my personal security is very carefully taken care of. But other guards that I've hired have turned out to be cowards or weaklings or worse. It doesn't seem to be saving me any or money. Already working for the diamond. 
Uh, that is something I've suspected, but I've had no truth of it yet, no proof that I can that I can manage. But that is where I hope the three of you can can illuminate me, or at the very least eliminate this problem. I have a proposition for you. One that I will say will make you a bit of coin, and with my backing, can also make you some very good connections in this town. There aren't too many people that I don't know who are uh, worth any knowing, of course. I see. Mm-hmm. Well, what is your offer in specifics, then? Well, what I'd like to do is capture or kill the diamond. But we'll work towards that if this relationship works out as much as I hope it does. The first stage is finding more out about this criminal. I have a proposition for that. You see, I've made it very well known that I routinely send caravans back and forth with goods from the port and returned money and goods from Pitajun. I even keep a rather regular schedule, at least... And he leans in a little bit towards the table. At least that's the story that I'm making sure everyone is very aware of. One of those is coming up very shortly. And I've also let it known that there's some very special cargo on board this particular travel. Some really good uh, jewelry made with delightful pearls fished right out of the bay itself. Now, what I would like to have the three of you do is, in subtle form, accompany my caravan. This could not be a bigger bait for that low-life scum. He will, no doubt, send people to intercept my caravan, and when he does, you'll be on hand to, well, rebuff their attempt. As well, hopefully, capture the diamond. But in case that coward does not decide to attend in person, perhaps you can, you can capture some of their people and make them speak. Of course, if that part is unpalatable um, to you, I have some people I can turn to. And kind of looks a little bit up towards uh, Lild, who just sort of smirks a little bit. I'll smirk back. I have ways of making people tell the truth. Ah, from, the light of Ignis burns all lies. From our experience dealing with the diamond, because we've had issues with him as well, he does not show up in person often. We've only seen him once. Uh, he I is suspect, very evasive. As I suspected. He, but, but, surely we can get his people to tell us more. And that is worth it enough for me. We may be... Uh, when is the caravan? The caravan is scheduled to leave tomorrow morning. And you haven't made it too obvious that he might not think it's a trap? I am somewhat skilled in knowing whose ears to tell what thing. I'm pretty sure that while I've laid it on a little thick, he will take the bait. Could you identify who leaks the information? Or who works for him. I suspect I know one person, or two people at least, who work for him. We might be able to make them talk first. It might be difficult. I find that they need a lot of persuading. And I will say that the one I had cornered once managed to escape. They are quite wily. What did and, he look like? Ah, uh, he was half-elven, a little taller than probably any of you. Dark hair. And as he starts to describe him, the uh, the image comes back to you of the one who was uh, casting spells at the temple way back when. Pollen. That guy. He managed to cast a spell and get out before yes, I was able to one. convince him. That one was a problem for us the first time we met them. So, I suspect that you have a few more different resources than I do. 
Now, of course, you will be paid handsomely for this. And, as I said, I can lean in the right directions to make things easier for you if you, if you have some need of that. My influence is very strong here. Hmm. Understood. Uh, we... That time we had an encounter with them where we met the one you, you described. There were others with him. Three or four others, I believe. Some of them work at the... Words, words, damn it. Guard. The guard tower. The captain is aware of this. He doesn't seem to be that surprised by this information. There are reasons why I chose to not come directly to that unfortunate captain. He has his limitations and has thus far refused any additional service that I might be able to contract for protection. But I had suspected that the diamond's ears are everywhere. I've heard all sorts of rumors, but nothing I've been able to track so far. It's not exactly the sort of thing I can look into very easily. Where is your caravan traveling to, and how how long would we be away? The caravan shall be traveling to, and I have to look this up because I just realized I switched away from that screen. Buttons, buttons, buttons. Um, this caravan will be heading towards Pettidune eventually, but to Lake Olam and then to Thorum Hall to pick up some more things. At least that's the established route. And how long would that take if we were there, if we were with the caravan the whole time? Well, the caravan traveling to Pit of June will take several days. But I suspect that the diamond's range is limited to this side of the Parvacolis. The Parvacolis is a set of smaller mountains at the foot of Demthurum. Okay. The map is really useful. I know. I'm looking at it right now. <laughs> That's why I'm <laughs> I believe we have something to talk about then. We can let you know uh, shortly. Indeed. Excellent. Your reputations are well deserved, I hear. I hope that we can come to a very useful agreement. For all of our benefits, of course. Once this area is removed to that particular pest, so much more business will come through here. I will say, if we are to do this, we do kind of stand out. So we would need access to some sort of disguises. It's hard to stifle the light of Ignis. Maybe uh, I can hide in a crate or something. Marked expensive jewelry. <laughs> Silas. The caravan I'll be sending with you will be covered. And you can hide inside there, along with a few of my associates. Silas uh, suddenly looks like a six foot six version of uh, Lild. Uh, and says, I'm not sure what you're talking about, any. <laughs> Lild kind of looks Would she down, be coming with us? Not exactly surprised, but sort of crocks, uh, car, uh, cracks an eyebrow. Uh, slightly impressed momentarily. Then I make my arms bigger than hers. <laughs> <laughs> you see her shift slightly on her feet, but. Um, you get the impression, actually, Medric probably would notice most of all, um, she's not exactly getting ready to fight, but she is limbering up her hands a little bit, just in case. She the little will be remaining behind <laughs> for my own personal security, of course. The people I send with you are reliable enough, not really capable of fending off a full attack from that tyrant, but I'm sure they'll do fine. That's good. Okay. I'm wondering if we should attempt to get answers from the ones at the guard tower. 
but probably not because they might alert the others. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, is already aware of them. Yeah, I do tell you all of this in confidence. Given your reputations, I believe that I have not erred in my judgment, but it should be said that if my judgment has indeed proven incorrect, there will be consequences. Understood. Of we course. will repeat this to nobody. Good, good. It's always nice and refreshing to find competent young people who understand what really needs to be done. I'll nod. Well. I hope this agreement can be mut mutually beneficial. And he looks at your hand, only hesitating for the moment that you would recognize, <laughs> um, but is swift enough that most would not, uh, and takes your hand and shakes it very, very firmly. How? What is your handshake like to to him? Um, it is probably probably a firm, like gentle but firm, if that makes sense. Okay. Yep. All right. So, uh, my, my hand is probably like out of habit, more of tur turned over a little bit more than it should. <laughs> It is good to know that I am dealing with a proper lady in truth. Um, yeah, okay. Um, I will, and I, he kind of stands up. Yep. I will be honest. Uh, I probably do have my singing ring, so if you want a, a perception check on that, by all means. Okay. I don't take it off, so. Uh, if I can find the right window to type in. Uh, me, me, my brain was like, I don't take that off. Maybe just turn it up, like, inside out. All right. I have two computers and two keyboards and two mice, and I'm definitely typing in the wrong one. Pardon me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Where is the typing? <laughs> it's like having too many tabs open and trying to find where the music is coming from. Definitely. Oh, man. How many times have I done that? <laughs> Um, he kind of smiles and, 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 and nods to you. Um, he does seem to notice the ring, but doesn't seem to take note of the ring. Um, you get the impression uh, in some ways that um, by he's already pegged you somehow as a lady, partially from the story that's been gotten about, but also your, your manners as well. So he doesn't seem surprised to see an, a, a, an important ring on your finger. He has several of them himself. Um, if anything, yep. he's kind of looking at the rest of the fingers, which are also bare, and thinking, hmm, okay, likes rings, <laughs> and get more. Um, he uh, stands up from the table, and to a certain degree, um, said Silas and Medrick, uh, you feel as though he's, he's sort of realized who the leader is and made the deal with her, where the two of you are kind of important, but he, he feels as though he's kind of made up his mind a little bit about uh, about the the, oh. the leadership here. Uh, but he, he ste steps up from the table and slides the chair back. Now, if you'll excuse me, my time is valuable. And while I've enjoyed spending so much with you, I do have other arrangements to make. I hope to hear back from you by this evening so we can proceed first light. If you do not find this of interest to you, and I would find this to be personally an awful result. But if you should not be interested, I suppose I can understand. But I really sincerely hope to see your word come to me this evening and this deed be done. Now, if you'll Understood. excuse me. Talk soon. Kind of nods to each of you and turns and goes. Uh, Lil kind of lingers one more second behind. And again, there's sort of this appraising look. Now taking in Silas a little bit more differently than a moment ago. Uh, but uh, uh, there's a, a, a nod to Medric, which you recognize as sort of that soldier to soldier nod, kind of like recognizing that that uh, you know your your reputation is is earned, or at least seems to be so far. Far, she's taking you for direct respect. Um, Annie, the look is more kind of cursory but not dismissive it's sort of like i know who you are not i know who you are but i know what role yeah. you have here uh and 
you'll be dealt with differently in some ways. Uh, not that that's a threat. More of, more of uh, this is not, you're not the fight she's going to have. And then with yep. uh, Silas, there's more of an, uh, another eyebrow quirk as to try to figure out what the hell you are. Uh, <laughs> but a, a nod I can to take you. Goes. What the hell are you? <laughs> You're going to have him take me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, there's a nod similar to what she gives to uh, to Medrick as well. Uh, a, sort of half the nod, if you will, of respect. But she quickly turns and follows uh, behind, uh, behind uh, Ardwin. And uh, you can also see that uh, across her back, um, there are a pair of very uh, sharp-looking hand axes um, with gleaming blades as if they are very, very well-kept weapons. Uh, and indeed, the end of the maul that she's carrying, you thought it was sort of a, 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 a hammer. It is indeed a maul. It is a rough, large stone attached to a stick. Not very fancy. You get the impression it's Effective. almost more... more um, purposely crude if you will and you can also see there are certain dark stains on the on the uh, irregular surface of the uh, hammer as if it has indeed been used before uh, but she needs kinda, maintenance but looks effective yeah um, and she follows quickly behind uh, Ardwin uh, who uh, leaves a couple more coins on the uh, countertop looks like a few more gold coins for for Sandy and they step out Um this time, Lild kind of seems to threaten to take away that same guy's glass, but then doesn't bother, as he as she sort of sees the satisfaction that he smir that he uh, that he he flinched a little bit, um, and then they're gone. The room's silence kind of comes back to a normal dull roar, and you kind of get the impression that they're talking about that. Every once in a while, there are glances over in your corner. Um, for someone who talked about not wanting to get the story out. He was doing it very publicly, at least in this small tavern. All right. Uh, did he tell us where to find him if we take this job? He didn't, uh, but you get the impression that he he's known to be found? Yeah. Silas would probably know where he lives. It's not yeah, that he, big a deal. He, he has offices. Worst case scenario, uh, he's, he's getting a, mess, a magical message from my mind. Could be. That too. Um, um, I say it's a convenient offer that could get us what we need. Yeah, invites to the party. Yeah, I mean, my my original suggest uh, thought when I saw him was that we could gift him with the coffee in exchange for coming in as part of his his retinue, but. If he's willing to pay us to do this, then that can work just as well. Who knows? The coffee might have been part of one of his shipments. Mm. He'd be glad to have it recovered and not in the diamond. Mind hand. you, mind you, mind you, mind you. Uh, the information that Medric got, there was no survivors in that, or else that wouldn't have been there. Yeah, so there were survivors. In that particular mm -hmm. scenario where you found the coffee, you did find there were no survivors. The horse was slain. Um, there was obviously other things that were taken, but the coffee mm -hmm. and the other other uh, spices were missed yeah. as they were actually tucked away. That was also occurring on the road towards the uh, coal pack oh, oh. Uh, shoals, towards the lighthouse. Yeah. yeah. Um, unless this guy deals a lot with the lighthouse, I don't know if that would have been his shipment. Um but it was but too it, expensive to be going to the lighthouse. Yeah, yeah. So. They also made yeah. no mention of missing anything. Yeah. Um, no. No, I am fine with this, although I will say I'm not an assassin. If we want to bring in the diamonds, I'm all for it. If we're going out to murder him, I'm not all for it. Uh. I would rather capture the diamond or find a way to track him down. Or find a way to make him go away. I mean, he did help us that one time. Uh, he no, did he helped try... himself. Well, yes. Yeah, and he did try to kill us earlier. So that's neither or. Um, 
but but like Annie said earlier, he's not he's likely not going to show up to intercept a caravan. That that's like a peasant's work. Well, it's a petty thief's work. It's one of his people will do it, and we can well, he interrogate him in person. Anyways, he he seems to be possessing people. Uh, so I mean, right now I'm not sure of a way we could actually capture him, unless he's somehow stuck to the body. If he's like a spirit, then he may simply leave. Um, but we, we couldn't kill him. We could just make make him go away. Uh, well, but and if I we, do if, still have the two. Uh, no. Those uh, diamond brooches that his people keep in their collars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kept two of those, didn't I? Yeah, I don't know exactly remember how, how many. You picked them off of a few of the dead bodies. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I don't think we're going to be able to fake uh, membership, but if we can capture a number of his people anyways, that might get us more information on how to deal with them. Mm-hmm. And I can yeah. cast an area of truth where they can't lie. Sure. Um, so, yeah. I mean, like I said, uh, he didn't give us any an exact amount or anything, but... What do I... Does Silas know anything about his reputation as a merchant? Uh, or as... Like, does he tend to keep his word, or is he like a ruthless merchant type who squeezes people like Walmart? Uh, Let's call that a, uh, a history. That's quite check. a thing there. Walmart is Hardwin nasty. Walmart. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Wow, there you go. Very nice. Natural 20. There you go. Hey. So, Hardwin him for like a year and a half Arwen Cartwright came into town uh, uh, several years ago and came in with uh, a shipment from Pitajun. Um sort of took a, a look at the docks and the way everything was here and stayed and has been building an empire ever since um, he's bought out several merchants since then he uh, actually owns a couple of the ships that are coming into dock as well as, uh, it could be said, own several of the caravans that come into the town as well. Um, he has found a niche where he can make a lot of money uh, transporting goods um, and has his uh, fingers in a lot of different goods here. Uh, hasn't made any move on the fisheries whatsoever. Doesn't seem to be interested in that whatsoever, really. Um, but more in, in uh, import-export. Uh, does actually uh, export some of the wood as well from some of the nearby forests that have unique features, uh, as well as, uh, uh, you know, kind of goods manufactured here, um, has been known to buy up several businesses and force out the competitors. So um, there is a bit of a, a positive negative reputation, if you will, where he's very well respected as being extraordinarily powerful and has literally been known to essentially buy and sell people. He has enough money to throw around that if someone opposes him, he can literally buy their business uh, and then and then fire them from their own business. Uh, but has also been known to back certain enterprises. Um, like recent, scuttlebutt, recent scuttlebutt is that the monument to be placed in town has been paid by for uh, him. That's not confirmed. That's just a rumor, but it does seem like something he might do. Um have I heard of any connections to, like, smuggling or criminal enterprises? Uh, not directly. There are those, this is the negative side of the reputation. There are those that say he's up to all sorts of nefarious things, uh, that he is doing smuggling, that some of the crates that come through are filled with nothing more than uh, drugs or poison or possibly even people. None of them seem to be uh, proven. Uh, he's never seemed to have been brought up on any charges whatsoever that you've heard of. Um, but, uh, you know, the, 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 the allegations are leveled against him. Uh, but nothing seems to ever either stick or nothing seems to ever get all the way to, to uh, uh, the justice system. So, ruthless businessman. Would he uh, know anything uh, about the uh, clockwinder warehouse or his cargo? You'd have to ask him about that. Okay. There's I'd a good chance that he knows a lot of what's happening. I'd much prefer to get into the party right now. Yeah. 
The clock winder is a secondary issue. Yeah, he can, <laughs> he can wait for a bit. Yeah, the party is definitely the first priority. So, anything else you want to discuss about this? No. I'm uh, all for it. Sure. It's a convenient arrangement that yeah. may get us what we need. Maybe just ask him uh, if any of his people have made it back from the raided caravans. How like how big the parties were? Did they have like melee people, like archers, casters? Just so we know, like what. Or have I have a magic bow expect. now. <gasps> Brain. Hey. <laughs> hey. But yeah, just get more information okay. if we're gonna do it, basically. From the rumors or from the information you had found, Medric, you there is word that. Um, if the if the diamonds involved, it does not seem to be a kill everyone situation. At least that's what dev several people assert. Uh, there have been uh, kill all caravan raids that have happened, but for for some reason, um, the diamond was not associated with those. Partially because they'd happened uh, more frequently before he came onto the scene. Mm -hmm. So kill everybody if they resist, which we will. And just remember, we need to take people alive. Yes. Yep. Well, I guess that's a go then. Okay. You send a, a note off or, or drop a note off at his offices, or how do you let him know? I'll leave that to Silas and Annie, because I don't know where the guy lives. <laughs> and also, uh, yeah, make sure that he knows we're looking for invites to the party. Like, Annie would have a way to, like, make that a subtle request, whereas Vetrick is like, oh, yeah, by the way, with payment, can we get, invite can we get invited to your party? <laughs> or to the parents' party? I think we might want to wait on that till after we've succeeded. Yep. And, okay. then, and then we can try to. And then we can barter for that. Yeah. All right. You got the sense too from what he was talking about. While he sort of agreed that the diamond probably isn't going to show up at this particular raid, um, with success meant he would have more work for you. All right. So you you drop off uh, a note at uh, his office dealing with his secretary because he's busy in meetings. Um, what are you just saying in the note? Just saying we're in, or we will accept your offer, or we'll be there tomorrow morning. Let's do this. Yeah, probably probably the uh, where uh, like. We'll be there. Where do we? Where do we meet you? Okay. Um, and the the secretary would have that detail on hand. Uh, basically, they'll have a, a their stables just north of the um, the um, market square, um, where a lot of the caravans do actually assemble before they head out. And his his care he has his own set place in the stables. Literally, it is bought and paid for by him. No one else uses it. Um, so they'll be there to uh, leave in the morning. And they, uh, the secretary, who probably should give a name at some point, I'm sure you will deal with them again, um, does tell you, though, uh, the name of the leader of the caravan is Melora. Um, there will be two wagons, four people, two person per, ter, uh, per wagon going with you. Um And that's all that the secretary will pass on. You said two wagons, four people per wagon? No, four people in total, aside from you. Okay. The fact that there are four people going and they've hired the three of you 
uh, as the specialist does kind of give you some indication of how much um, Ardwin suspects that the people alone would work, how well they would do on their own. Uh, okay. Because four people are not as good as the three of you. Okay. Yep. Well, Silas will head home to let his family know that he's going to be gone for a day or so. Uh, and uh, to pick up his uh, armor and jacket and shield, all that stuff. Okay. Um, Dogol has started sort of mocking out on paper using simple charcoal some ideas he has about the statue of the mother. Um, what directions do you give to Dogol? <laughs> That's absolutely terrifying. Perfect. Great. Um, there is a lot tentacles. of debate among the cult about the actual form of the mother. Um, well, well, Silas will show them the form of the mother. Uh, he did that. Uh, he would have done that during the, the celebrations. That has uh, quelled the debate somewhat, but there is some dissenting opinion, and you probably have any idea where those dissenting opinions are coming from. Um, but there's also a little bit of lore there where she has appeared in different forms before. Yeah. Um, um, Silas will basically show uh, Dogal what he's seen of her and her appearance and would suggest that uh, maybe something with like her, her pose or her, her demeanor should look protective or mothering or something like that. Um, after all, she takes care of us. Um, and probably working in something that's not too, uh, not terribly big right now, because uh, we don't have a temple or anything for any sort of big statuary. But uh, we can put it in with the uh, the stone with uh, all the writing on it that uh, we worship already. All right, I'll, I'll do what I can. I've got some ideas. I'll need to think on it and do a lot of sketches before I really get started, though. Oh, no worries. There's no immediate rush. Um, this is... It's a long game to play. Uh, we're starting work now, and it may be a while before we're done. My mother, told, sure you to, my mother told me to, to thank you. It's not that I don't want to thank you, but she insisted that I make sure that I thank the Harbinger for the choice. It's it's an honor, really. Um, I mean, it was an obvious choice. Uh, I'm sure you'll do good. I, I'm, I'm sure that it'll turn out perfectly fine. Uh, I will be back in a couple of days so we can talk more later. So. Okay. He kind of blushes at the at the compliment and you can see that, that steely look of determination that he's going to make this the best thing he's ever done. Good. That's what I like to see in the members' zealousness. <laughs> um, how does Annie and Medrick get ready for the, the next day? Um, I would probably um, make sure that my... get ready to use my disguise kit in the morning just so that I can, like have that already grab some food for for the road um make sure everything's packed up uh, anything important is in the box okay yeah over this last couple of weeks too there's been a bit of a hubbub in the building as they're rebuilding that suite that got crushed at yep. the end of the hall from you <laughs> um, it has been reoccupied now not by the same person but uh, it looks like by a family of three uh, parents, mm -hmm. two parents, and a, and a young girl who's uh, there. And the girl pokes her head out every once in a while uh, when you walk by. Um, she's shy. She's probably about 12. Uh, just kind of curious about who you are. But she's too shy to say anything at this point and keeps kind of pops her head out, sees you there. As soon as she, she notices you're watching her, she kind of goes and closes the door. I, I wave her. back. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. How about Medrick? Anything you'd like to do that? that evening yeah, quick quick prayer to ignis in the evening or morning 
Well, you'll be leaving in the morning. Yeah, okay. So getting ready in the evening, not too, too much, just a quick prayer to Ignis. And in the morning, I'd prepare my spells, like pick up my armor, shield, all my stuff, make sure I'm not forgetting anything like I would in real life. <laughs> you got a list. <laughs> Check it twice. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, prepare spells, make sure Zone of Truth is in there. She, um, <laughs> Silas would check with Annie to see if perhaps she wants to make up uh, some of that moss tea that might uh, help restore all the bruising that's up and down her side. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that. <laughs> I, w I would have talked with Med Medrick about this beforehand. Yeah, yeah, that one's only uh, lesser restoration, I believe, to recover that injury. So, yeah, uh, which no, I have set up right now. I was so I can do that to restore before even in one go, or uh, lesser would bring it down one level. But it's only a small injury, I think, right? No, it's a medium. medium. Oh, okay. So yeah, you could use the lesser restoration to bring it. Actually, you could use it twice, technically. Yeah. So I could do that, then have a long rest, and oh, I got my stuff back. Yeah. So yeah, some of the stiffness has been removed. The information hard hard earned. Uh, you now know that the uh, the uh, Cape Raven not as scalable as it looks. No. <laughs> especially especially when everything is damp and muddy and. Handholds slip. Yeah. Which may be, in fact, one of the reasons they chose it as the place to put that loca location because it's not easy to assault that particular uh, castle, that particular place. Um, so, the next morning, you uh, greet the sun as it rises, I suspect, Medric. Looks oh, yeah. like it go it's going to be a nice, bright, warm day. Um, part of you kind of remembers your teaching, which is that. If it's a nice day, Ignis has brought it. If it's a, not a nice day, then the world has let Ignis down. <laughs> it's kind Do of better, people. It's kind, of, it's kind of phrased in that way. But in this day, Ignis is smiling upon you. Uh, you can start to feel the warmth and shift in the air, not only because the storm is now long uh, gone, passed into song and memory, but also because the first wisps of spring uh, are truly underway. Uh, delayed a little bit by the storm itself, perhaps, uh, but now the warm breeze is coming off the water, bringing that salty smell uh, throughout the town. You gather at the stables, and specifically at the Cartwright stable, and meet the people that is set to take this particular caravan. Four people. Melora, a... Uh, i got to scroll here just a second. Where did it go? I've had scroll fail, pardon me. <laughs> scroll up. Um, would you like down. me to roll for the disguise kit? Yes, please. And uh, give me some indication of what your disguise is meant to look like, depending on how the roll turns out. Um, um, so what I'm going for, let me just get it here. Uh, what I'm going for is probably making my hair look darker, because that's a very identifiable feature. Um but also make myself look more tired uh, okay. and less of a threat. So, yeah, different hair and tired. <laughs> different hair and tired. False okay. beard. <laughs> False beard. <laughs> a very tired-looking beard. Eleven. Okay. Um, yeah, so you you apply some some makeup to kind of look make your features look a little bit more drawn out. Um, what color is her hair normally? Is it uh, a very gold? Very gold. What color was she very going gold. for? Uh, she probably like day to day she makes her hair look a bit more dirty blonde. Okay. So she'd probably try to go a little bit darker than she usually goes. Okay. Something went a little bit weird in that it comes out kind of a greenish gold <laughs> like a tarnished gold today so it's not exactly the darker color you were looking for but it, it is definitely different from what most people would see you as uh, yep okay and uh yeah you gather there to meet the people that were going to be there melora uh, 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 yep. a little old man but five foot four with his walking stick walks into you look like a marsh 
<laughs> and then walks, it continues walking in. Uh, is that in fact Silas, or is that yes. just an NBC that randomly drove by? Okay. Nope. That is <laughs> just by uh, itself on. Okay. Um, and <laughs> does Medrick take any extraordinary action towards his his visage? No. So Medrick just going to hide under blankets or something. <laughs> Right. Um, I can be a glowing six foot six half orc, or I can be a glowing different six foot six half orc. Yes. <laughs> Disguise. I'm not. I'm Midric, the tax evading cousin. <laughs> You're immediately arrested. <laughs> uh, all right. So you meet uh, the the four people that are going to be going with you, uh, Melora. Uh, a young woman in her probably 20s or so, um, whereas Annie tried to look like she was, uh, uh, you know, older. Melora doesn't try to look older. She just seems to have that impression of looking older. Um, she's uh, uh, kind of, you, you get the impression that she's been a farmhand or a caravan uh, rider for a long time, uh, just because she seems very at ease in, in the, uh, on the saddle, or I shouldn't say saddle, on the, uh, the board up front where she's going to be sitting. And very comfortable with the horses. She's currently kind of grooming them. There are four horses, two to each uh, uh, wagon. The wagons themselves are fairly simple, um, uh, essentially buckboard, but a little bit more reinforced. Um, they do have can uh, canopies of uh, canvas stretched over uh, a wooden frame on the back. Uh, in the back of that first wagon is going to be Petrock. Petrock is a half-orc. Um, he seems to be a little younger than her. Um, and a little bit more eager. Uh, Petrock also has a short bow. Um, actually, I think uh, all of them have some sort of sword. Um, it doesn't look like a standard sword between them. They each seem to have picked up sort of second-hand or third-hand swords. Um, one of them looks remarkably like some of the weapons the, the uh, Sea Devils were using, and you have the impression that probably a lot of those were picked up and resold on the local markets. Uh, as uh, as useful useful junk, uh, Petrock is uh, 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 a little bit shorter as well. Um, keep, seems to be making up a little bit of that as well. The driver so on the he's second. He's in the back of the first wagon or second. He's in the back of the first wagon. Yeah. The second wagon. The driver is named Stefan. Um, Stefan is tall and thin and a little bit older. Um, you'd probably guess in his. Late thirties, early nineties, or early nineties. Late thirties, early, <laughs> early. That's that's some days how I felt. Uh, late, late, you know, early forties, late nineties. No, uh, late thirties, early forties. Um, doesn't talk very much. Doesn't seem to have much for an expression. Uh, but you get the impression that Melora and Stefan have worked together before, um, and there's just sort of a regular pattern between the two of them. Melora will say something, and Stefan will not have to really answer so much as just sort of nod. And gets the full response from, from that. Uh, he does have a, a very small, very broad uh, short sword strapped onto his back with an easy reach. Uh, also carrying a whip, which probably is intended more for the horses. Doesn't seem to be that long. In the back is Kara. Uh, Kara is a uh, half-elf. Um, it's really hard sometimes to tell with half-elves how old they are. And she seems to be younger than any of them, younger than any of you. But there's a, a deepness in the eyes that that uh, probably uh, Annie reads more than anyone one else. That sort of look of experience that you've, you've encountered with different half-elves. Um, moves very lithely, very comfortably. Uh, and she's carrying a short bow as well, but their short bow looks like it was probably very, very expensive. Um... It just looks like it's made of very, very well-made uh, wood uh, with a bit of, of, of ornamentation on it as well uh, and has a, a quiver of elves, a quiver of elves, quiver of arrows. Never read something and try to say something else at the same time. It's a quiver of arrows uh, uh, sitting behind, and she's going to be in the second wagon. There are boxes of uh, goods in each wagon as well that are, Kind of labeled, but labeled very sparsely, uh, with initials like A T A G and 
uh, RF. There's no explanation given of what's in them. Um, Melora just sort of shrugs if you ask her what's what's in them. Um, and yeah, two horses uh, uh, for each wagon as well. Two horses? Okay. Yeah, two horses for each wagon. The horses in front seem to be a matched pair. As the horses in the back seem to be of very different size styles. Um, and the back one with Stefan is a, a large white horse and a large brown horse. And the two up front seem to be of, of sort of a noble breed of horse. Uh, and they look to be almost identical. Uh, very possibly uh, were actually uh, sibling horses. Uh, the see the one in the back one is a Hanova and the other one is a Safino the two up front are both Aras yeah I, I went back to my horse chart <laughs> all right I drew little diagrams of all of this awesome you it's can't see like it because a, the camera's like a blank page oh, there there we go. Go. <laughs> <laughs> hey whatever whatever makes it work for you all right. How are you arranging yourselves between the two uh, two wagons? Melora's uh, wagon is going to go up front. Do we want to separate each other from in the two wagons? Yeah, probably. Uh, Silas will sit at the back of the back wagon so he can uh, watch out the back of it. I'll be in the back part of the front one. Yeah, I'll also be in the back of the first one. Okay. I just realized I can actually set that up if I need to. Uh, all right. So, uh, it's... But, you know, just say again, it was, I believe, Silas in the back one, as, as well as Medrick and Annie in the front. Am I right? Yeah, Med uh, Medrick and Annie are in the front one. Medrick and Annie in the front one, okay. Okay. Uh, with the size of the wagons, um, you can kind of fit, they're basically the equivalent of 10 feet wide. So you can fit two people side by each in the back of each wagon. Um, are you going to stay in the middle or are you going to stay towards the back where you can spot th things? Um, with the two of you in the front wagon, uh, either Petrock or one of you can be in the back and the other one can person can be at the back kind of to spot. Uh, you can also ride up front with Melora or with Stefan. There's enough space for two people to sit on this. I, I'm, imagine basically a Wild West wagon. It's kind of a buckboard wagon. Um, very yeah. simple, ma simply made, but sturdy. I'd probably stay um, in the back because I don't want any assailants to see Medric. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I can go up front with my hood away. now. So you're going to stay up front, Annie, with uh, with Melora or up front of the wagon? I, I can go uh, up, up front in the, in the wagon there. Okay. You can still see out the front of the wagon. It's just a bit more obscured, basically. There's no no front and back walls on this. It's very much open. The only walls yeah. are on the curved sides. How about for Silas? Are you going to stay in the back to watch out the front, uh, watch out the, the opening with Kara? Uh, Kara? Uh, yep. Okay. Yeah, he'll just watch out the back. Okay. Just need to... I realized the place I copied them from was where you guys were already hurt. So that's probably not good. And if it comes to a map, which I do clearly have something in mind, but let's see what happens when it gets there. Um, if I don't have the number uh, correct on your hit points, piece by sure, by all means, reset them. Uh, I should note, too, that, yes, I did see uh, Annie's note. So, Annie, one of the things you had, had done while you were on downtime is you had someone actually take the limb of Azamunta, was given to you by Namti, the green limb, and turn it into a bow, a very beautiful yep. looking bow. Uh, nice. It currently has a purple flower uh, uh, kind of growing out of one side of it. 
Um, and you took the four thorns and made them into darts. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I was wondering, just because I was messing around in Dandy Beyond there, um, what's the modifier for the Hill of Thorns, like the the casting oh, ability? Uh, that's a good question. Let me see if I yeah. have that noted down here. I might not have it noted down here, so I might have to do that just after we're done today. Yep. Um, just, just a... It doesn't say in the in the document, so... Good to know. It okay. just says, cast Hail of Thorns. Right. Uh, I will look up. That might be end up being calculated off of your own modifiers. Uh, the sun is yep. going down, and I've currently got this this weird sort of slash light on me here that's kind of weird I thought <laughs> would, would um, so mysterious yep. mysterious gm in the corner here <laughs> i'm fine with getting the answer later i just wanted to write it down before i forgot to ask totally appreciate that thank you very much all right um with the light of the sun barely above the horizon they're ready to set out any other further things before you leave town Nope. If, Although if, I make sure the uh, large stone is in my backpack. Okay. Just in case there's motherfuckers that attack us. <laughs> uh, I don't say that out loud, though, because I don't want him to pop out. <laughs> so, you, so you have a fairly large bag, because uh, that thing is fairly fairly large uh, for your, your luggage. Uh, and there is yeah. a little bit of Edric a look. is also from, very large. Uh, there's a look from, from uh, Petrock as it kind of looks at your, uh, you know, as if to say, like, are you expecting to stay for a while? <laughs> kind of, because you brought more luggage than anybody else has so far. Um, uh, it's just my pet rock, man. Mm -hmm. I'll nod to him. Okay. Pet rock. <laughs> I just realized. <laughs> pet rock. <laughs> <laughs> that was not intentional at all. That is hilarious. That was Oh. That's why you always have to say all your NPC names out loud at some I mean, point. <laughs> sure, I yeah, I know, but it just kind of. <laughs> <laughs> but so, sometimes it it takes the context as well for you to yes, realize. <laughs> yes, it's it's that's oh now the light is crossed across my camera, so I'm completely washed out. This is weird; it's never happened before. Sunlight? Do we have sunlight again? But yes, yeah. uh, Petrock is very amused by your pet rock <laughs> but i'm sorry that's way too funny uh and uh uh yeah sure that i'm not changing his name that's who he is uh <laughs> sorry you completely derailed me <laughs> focus focus in my <laughs> weird you know shaded out version of myself that's so weird uh as you set forth and Melora is eager to get on the road as well. Uh, on to the King's Road. And the King's Road, as you recall, was a very fine crafted uh, stone road that runs all the way to uh, to Pitajun from here. Um, the road itself, there were some, some damages to it. But it looks as though in the intervening few weeks since last you'd gone ac across here, maybe because of the increased caravan traffic or maybe because someone took pride in it, the road is very well maintained once again. Um, there's some some notion that it might even be a dwarven-made road, but you've not encountered all that many dwarfs, uh, even though you do know that Dem Thorum is not that far away, um, which is a dwarven undermountain city. Um, you head through and towards uh, the sort of northeast uh, as the road kind of straight moves by. Um, someone clearly has been maintaining it a bit because it looks like they've pulled trees back away from the road um, as though they've kind of been doing some clearing here as well. Um, as you move along, um, it kind of occurs to you, and maybe there's a bit of, of, of discussion as well that, that uh, Petrock would have with uh, Medrick and, and uh, Annie about how um, he was glad to see that they'd finally taken that advice. Um, that Master Cartwright had been saying for a long time that they needed to start clearing trees further and further back uh, from the road. So logging crews had been sent out specifically to start doing that. It gives no cover on the sides of the road here um, and uh, nothing but stumps. The further you go away from the town, however, 
that's when you start to realize that it probably was a town-based initiative. Uh, the road is still fine and secure, but the trees are less thinned further and further back. Off to your left, though, you do see the uh, the running of the uh, the lake. Um, where did it go? Uh, lake Alum. Uh, sorry, not Lake Lake Alum. The River Alum that runs from Lake Alum uh, right out towards. Um, oh, and of course, I can't look at that again. <sighs> I've just encountered that bug. So I can't look at the map anymore. That's okay. Um, oh, there it is. Uh, yes, the Alum River. Uh, it crosses over uh, the King's Road at a certain point. Uh, you travel for most of that day, uh, making your way along the King's Road. Not much is seen except a few deer along the way. Um it takes a little bit of effort for Petrock not to want to hunt some of the deer, uh, as they haven't. They've brought some supplies, but fresh meat along the trail is is not to be uh, um, sno uh, scoffed at. But given the, the pressure of it, uh, Melora tells him in no uncertain terms, uh, no hunting. Um, she seems quite firm on that. Um, you also notice that Melora doesn't seem nervous at all. Petrock has that sort of um, uh, eager nervousness. He, you get the sense that he really knows what this is all about, and is is really uh, eager to get in, into it. Maybe even prove himself. Um, that's not uncommon with orcs and half orcs. Is that there is a sort of sense of 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 eagerness to prove something. Medric, you would be reflecting on a little bit as well. Oh, yeah. um, your your eagerness showed up in your willingness to join not only the military but join and become and swear to become a Kmar, um, something which ultimately led you to where you are now. Uh, in the other wagon, uh, Stefan is very nervous uh, and uh, seems to be taking out a little bit on the horses. Um, he's cracking his whip every once in a while, not striking them, but definitely trying to keep them extraordinarily focused on traveling further and further straight ahead. Um, not in a cruel way, but at the same time, uh, definitely uh, uh, not a normal trip for him. Um, whereas uh, Kara seems extraordinarily relaxed. Um, for her, it doesn't seem like any more than just a ride along the way. Uh, Silas will say, now, now, don't take it out on the horse. Everything will be fine. <laughs> Is he maintaining that same <laughs> old man illusion? Oh, the old man voice probably comes and goes. <laughs> um... I think but, every, uh, every time it comes, Kara just laughs. <laughs> and it just is, it's so absolutely ridiculous. Um, uh, Stefan just sort of turns his, his head back and sort of nods. Um, seems to slow the whip a little bit, but every once in a while it still comes out. You get the impression that because these two horses are very different, they also don't work very well together, um, kind of like they have their own independent spirit. And to a certain degree, it's not about spurring them on. It's about making them pay attention to not go faster than the other person or than the other horse. Uh, and so the wagon lurches every once in a while as one of the horses decides it's going to go a little bit faster. And the other one either runs faster to keep up or obstinately tries to move slower. And the whole wagon tilts and shifts a little bit. Um, I wish we had a, a druid here to uh, cast speak to animals and hear all their drama. <laughs> Um, Silas, make a perception check. Okay. Yeah. There's nothing unusual about what's happening in terms of the wagon itself. Oh, no. Uh, about uh, three quarters of the day, you've stopped for lunch at one time, um, just very briefly, uh, long enough to... Uh, kind of distribute lunch more than anything else. Um, actually, it wouldn't even be stopping. You'd be slowing down a little bit. Uh, they do want to check on the horses. Sorry, they would stop. They would want to check on the horses. That makes sense. Sorry about the waffling there. Uh, but then in the mid-afternoon, uh, you'll find yourselves, uh, and the pace is not fast. Um, you get the impression, uh, let's see, probably Annie, um, having having ridden probably on most uh, most wagons of anyone here and haven't actually traveled on caravan a couple of times in your travels, this is not a fast pace for a caravan 
this is a slow pace for a caravan. And you kind of get the feeling after a while, like, why is it moving so slow? Oh, wait, we're bait. <laughs> and, uh, and they're kind of trying to maximize the amount of time that you guys are exposed, if anything else. Um, that kind of Every now and then, it's like, oh, dear. Just little old me to defend this caravan. <laughs> Kara, I hope is attacks. Kara is in stitches. Uh, just kind of, you can see now that her sides are actually. I just want to go see my grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only two days from retirement. <laughs> oh, with all this gold. Midrick will scream from the front wagon. <laughs> if we get attacked, just talk to them. You'll bore them to death and they'll leave. <laughs> uh, yeah, Kara spends half of her time laughing at, at, at Silas in this ridiculous performance. Um, but uh, as you continue to move along, uh, the river starts getting larger and larger until finally uh, you reach a, a bridge which travels over, across, over the river. Um, it's uh, probably about uh, uh, 60 or 80 feet across the bridge. It's a bit of a gorge now where the river over many, many years is starting to slowly carve its own valley through here. Uh, but the bridge is built uh, to dwarven standards just like the road. Seems solid and, and uh, unmovable. You also notice, as I've mentioned, that the trees are no longer cleared further and further away from the, the road. Um, actually, all three of you can make nature checks. Just see where this sure. leads. Okay, that's pretty good. Oh, that's intelligence. I've read about nature. <laughs> We're seen, in nature right now. I've seen nature in books. Um, so Silas, you're the one to kind of pick up on the uh, on this. As you're looking around, a lot of the trees are relatively new growth. Um, in other words, they they've regrown um, much more recently than than uh, than what had been here this had been cleared at one point but it seems to be mostly smaller trees but every once in a while there's a larger tree and what's really weird is some of those larger trees they look like they're much much larger than the trees around them they should all be relatively the same size if they all started regrowing at the same size it strikes you as kind of odd as you're crossing over the over the uh, bridge and looking back and then there's a loud crack as a tree up ahead falls down across the road. This, feels this a little seems bit... familiar. Yeah, Silas will uh, say into Medrick's, uh, well, into Marie's head and then Medrick's head. He's only do one at a time. Marie, uh, oh, well, not, this not Mar is a trap. Or, I think this is a trap. <laughs> well, not into Marie's head, but you find it rebuffed by Annie's head. <laughs> Well, she, that thing stops her from being read or sensed, but I don't think it stops unless, her from getting a message. Unless I allow it, nobody can co communicate, yeah. but I would allow Silas. Okay. Um, so there's a bit of resistance, but it goes through. But yes, there's a bit of, of a familiar feeling. Uh, the horses up front um, kind of calmly stop, again, noting just how, how calm and, and, uh, and relaxed they are. The two horses, however, in the middle seem very agitated and start to kind of uh, kick up uh, against the, uh, the wagon. Uh, the white one, which is on the uh, left, I believe, uh, or on the right, sorry, um, starts to, to really pull away at the wagon um, and uh, starts to kind of keep the wagon moving a little bit so it's a little bit unsteady in the back. Uh, Looking out the back, um, Silas, you can see another tree um, has come down, uh, but you did not see anything bring the tree down. There's a moment of, of quiet, and then splitting through the air, sounds from all directions, it feels like. Laughter? Loud? Animalistic? Laughter? And then Silas, from where you're sitting in the back, you see a creature uh, start to leap and run through the forest. 
calling out as it does and the answering call coming from numerous places in front and behind. It looks like a dog, but it laughs like a man. A pack of hyenas attacks. And that's where we'll pick up at the beginning of next session. Cool. Uh, that's it for today. Uh, we Not ran ready. a little bit over from normal, but that's okay. I think we were in a good place. It's good to hear from uh, people where they were getting to. Uh, we will pick up with the map next time and start a round of combat. How many hyenas? Lots. And more yeah. or less than you think because they, they travel in a way that they do not want you to know their numbers. They're like sand people. That's my comparison for the day. <laughs> So from uh, from myself and Petrock, I want to say thanks to my players for playing today. <laughs> that is the weirdest, funniest, and most delightful co coincidence I've had in a long time. I wish I'd made it like intentional instead of just saying like. When I went to say the character's like... name again, it hit me like a rock. You might say like a pet. Rock. But um, <laughs> um, you can. <laughs> yeah, thanks again to my players for joining me today. Uh, you can uh, watch this on YouTube if you're not doing that already. You can catch up by going to youtube.com slash ENCAF1. Look for the playlists. There are three playlists. Legends of Omatia is a general playlist. It contains all of both campaigns as well as some of the one-on-one -on -one shots we've done. Uh, Legends of uh, Omatia, the, or I should say The Great Confusion, contains this particular campaign, and Legends of the Drowned Isles contains... Uh, last campaign i believe that's how it's supposed to be working you can also find us on twitch every well most every sunday there's some sundays where i just can't stare at a screen for another day but most of the time we do try to run on sunday afternoon starting at three o'clock atlantic time for a couple of hours then you can also find us on facebook.com slash lotdi where you can join in and catch up because we're now posting summaries of previous episodes and we would love to see you there and chat with you as well. I'll be posting some of the images from this session. I've got the image for the world map that's been updated, as well as the image for... Um, there was another one. I've forgotten it. I will, I will post it, whatever it happens to be. Uh, and uh, maybe uh, from Medric, we can see a, a, a detailed sketch of what the tempo looks like. You showed me it. Detailed, detailed as in with MS Paint quality. <laughs> sure, absolutely. Gives us an idea of what we're dealing with. Uh, until then, again, thanks to my players. Thanks to you for watching. And uh, Thanks for running. Thank you very much. We will return again next week. I was there, do I say something? I don't think I say something. We're just going to say, we'll talk to you again. We'll play again. Yeah, that's it. We'll play again next time. <laughs>